The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, onward, Drakian soldiers marching as to the store. Black swords and widgie boards were rife among the Mongol hordes. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have a roundtable discussion of an excellent new short story anthology at Booksellers. It is called Onward Drake, and it's a collection of stories and essays edited by Mark L. Van Name, all of which have something to do with Bain-er author David Drake. The book has been put out in honor of Dave's 70th birthday, and to Mark Dave being a special guest at this year's World Fantasy Convention. What Mark did was ask a bunch of writers who are either friends or professional associates or both with Dave to write a story that is in some way influenced or touched by their association with Dave, and if they wish an essay on the story or their own relationship with Dave to accompany it. There are also a couple of essays in there by Dave's longtime publishers, Tony Weisskopf and Tom Doherty, that are just essays, since they aren't really fiction writers. The writers in the book are at the top of their form. Nobody wanted to phone it in on this one. And it's really a super collection of short stories, just on its own. There are stories by Gene Wolfe, Eric Flint, Larry Correa, Barry Ann Malsberg, S.M. Sterling, Cecilia Holland, Hank Davis, and one by yours truly, by the way, Tony Daniel, that I am very proud of. Mine is a tribute to Dave's fantasy novel, Old Nathan. Almost all the writers also provide afterwards in which they talk about Dave, and those are really fascinating, too. Plus, there are two, count them two, new David Drake stories in the volume, and one of those is the new Hammer Slammer story. David F. Sherrod, who many of you will know from the podcast, and as editor of last summer's very successful Year's Best Military SF and Space Opera Collection, conducted the interview. We're doing another Year's Best for next year, by the way. David does read just about everything, but feel free to drop him a note if you want to call his attention to something during the year. You can do that via info at Bain.com. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. First, we have news. Larry Correa's big old new high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword, is out at Booksellers now, a week earlier than our usual hardcover releases, because the crowds were metaphorically about to tear down the gates to get at it. We'll be talking to Larry soon about the book. I wanted to point out something cool in the hardcover that you won't see in the paperback editions. You will get it in the ebook. This is the fantastic color map we had done for the book by cartographer Ian Stewart. We used it as the end papers in the hardcover. It's really cool looking. We made sure Ian didn't put anything vital in the gutter, by the way. It really looks fantastic. And if you like to just have pretty books, uh, this is one to get in hardcover. By the way, Larry's co-author on the Dead Six series, Mike Kupari, has a debut novel at Booksellers starting next Tuesday, or right now at BainEbooks.com. It's a really good space opera called Her Brother's Keeper, there's a, a nice characterization of a guy in law enforcement in there that I was impressed with, by the way. Hi, everybody. It's David F. Shirod, and here on the Bain Free Radio Hour today, we are going to be celebrating David Drake and talking about a new anthology that does just that. It is called Onward Drake, and it is out now from Bain Books. It collects uh, stories and nonfiction appreciations of the Dean of Military Science Fiction from such authors as Gene Wolfe, Larry Correa, Mer Lafferty, S.M. Sterling, and uh, Barry Malsberg, among others, uh, including our uh, guest today. It also includes two stories by David Drake himself, uh, one of which is the first new Hammer Slammer stories in over a decade. Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a moment, maybe. But uh, first, I want to welcome the panel. We have Eric Flint 
here today. He has uh, co-written with David Drake books in the General series as well as the Belisarius series. And he talks about that period of writing those books uh, with uh, Dave Drake as something of his apprenticeship. Uh, he's gone on to uh, write numerous novels. Uh, he's perhaps best known for his 1632 series, which has spawned really an entire movement with multiple novels, short story collections, and a very active online community. The latest novel in that series is 1636, The Cardinal Virtues, and it is out now. Uh, his first novel, Mother of Demons, is available uh, in a limited leather-bound edition, so all of you fans and collectors better jump on that. I don't think it will last long uh, if it is, in fact, still available. Uh, Eric, thanks so much for being here. <clears throat> and we also have Tony Daniel. Tony is, of course, your host here on the Bain Free Radio Hour. He's also an editor at Bain Books and a writer. He is the author most recently of two books co-written with David Drake in the general series. Uh, those are The Heretic and The Savior. And next year, uh, Bain will publish his uh, YA heroic fantasy novel, uh, The Dragon Hammer. Uh, Tony, uh, I would say thanks for being here, but you're always here. So uh, thanks for talking with us today, I guess. Thank you for being here, David. We've also got uh, Hank Davis on the line. He is editor emeritus at Bain Books. Uh, he's edited such... Uh, anthologies as A Cosmic Christmas, A Cosmic Christmas to You, In Space No One Can Hear You Scream, and more recently, Future Wars and Other Punchlines. Uh, that's an anthology that collects humus, humorous military science fiction. Uh, Hank, good to talk with you. Uh, glad to be here. Incidentally, uh, Future Wars and Other Punchlines is dedicated to David Drake. There you go. All right, and finally we have Mark L. Van Name. He has written seven novels in his John and Lobo series. He's also written many short stories and edited several anthologies, uh, one of which it should not surprise you to learn is Onward Drake. Uh, Mark, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, Mark, I want to start with you since you are the editor. I wanted to ask you how this book came about. It is a tribute to David Drake. And I guess my first question is, um, why David Drake? I think all of us here today know the answer to that, and I think many of our listeners do, but... For people who perhaps are not as familiar with uh, Drake's work, um, why is it that he deserves uh, this uh, really neat honor of, um, of having this anthology dedicated to him? Well, back in uh, June of 2014, I noticed that Dave was going to be a special guest at the World Fantasy Convention in 2015. From being a good friend of Dave's, I also knew that this year, 2015, Dave would be turning 70. And Dave has been a huge influence in military science fiction, a prolific and best-selling writer in fantasy, and he's been publishing, uh, as of this year, will be 49 years, so he's going on 50 years of publishing. And it seemed like all of those factors made for uh, a great reason to honor him. And so I called up uh, the guy, Joe Berlant, who runs World Fantasy Con, who's a friend, and I said, if I could sell this idea... Would you make it, you know, a giveaway for all the attendees? And he said, sure. And then I emailed Tony Weisskopf and I uh, sent this message. It said, uh, a special project for which I have absolutely no time because I'm behind on a novel. And I pitched to her this anthology and giving it away at World Fantasy. And she said, oh, yeah, let's do that. But let's also do a leather bound special edition and let's do hardback, and so she enthusiastically supported it. We talked about uh, a list of writers I had uh, already had, and we added some folks and contacted people, and almost everyone I invited uh, found a way to, to get into the book. So it was, you know, there were a few folks where they had writing obligations and couldn't express deep regrets, but uh, it was just a confluence of events to give Dave some recognition that I think is uh, long past due, Dave would argue with that. And Dave is not a guy who ends up on award ballots. So he, uh, I think, has a strong legion of followers, uh, a lot of people he's helped, but hasn't gotten all the recognition I think he deserves. And so that's the uh, reason for the book. Yeah, and one thing you mentioned that I think is um, a reason the book works so well is, um, you know, Dave is the, the dean of military science fiction, but and while that's certainly, I think everyone would argue that's an appropriate title for him, it 
maybe gives people a, a wrong impression that he writes narrowly, which is not the case. He's he's all over, um, you know, from anything from fantasy to horror, space opera, time travel, adventure stuff. And so I think that's one thing I liked about this is you're honoring one person, and yet you've got such a wide range of, of stories in this book because he has uh, written such a wide range. Uh, one of those stories, which I mentioned, is the first new Hammer Slammer story in quite some time. I wondered how uh, how that happened, how you were able to uh, coax Dave uh, into writing another Hammer Slammer story. That's probably his most uh, well-known world that he's created. What was that like? Was it was it easy to get him to do another Hammer Slammers, or is he reluctant? How did that come about? So what I did was, after I got the project put together, uh, Dave's family and my family vacation together at the beach each year, and we have for... I don't know, 20 years or so. So I made sure that I had a strong slate of writers, so it was already rolling. And then at a big dinner uh, where our whole extended family was out eating together at the beach, I announced it in front of everybody and said, so Dave, we're doing this, and I want two stories from you. I want a fantasy and a science fiction, and I want the science fiction to be the first New Hammer Slammer story. And... So I kind of set him up. Those who know Dave know that he you can't really set him up but so much. And he, I explained my reasoning, which is that as a Hammer Slammers fan myself, I, I thought I could speak for other fans in saying that would be a, a big draw to the book and help sell the book. And uh, I thought it would be cool. And the last Hammer Slammers story he'd written was a, a superb piece called The Darkness. And I wanted to see what he would produce today. And I, I have to say that the story that's in the book, Save What You Can, I think is uh, one of the finest Hammer stories he's ever written. Yeah, I think that's probably a good characterization of it. Um, there's another Hammer Slammer story in the book, but it is not written by David Drake. It was uh, written by Larry Correa. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's the first, uh, you know, as much as Dave has collaborated with people, I think this is the first uh, first Hammer Slammer story not written by him. Is that right? Is this the first time someone else has written in that world? Yeah, this answer requires a little uh, more words than the the short form. The short form is yes, but I need to explain more. Dave sure, absolutely. Dave specifically never let anybody write in that universe. He absolutely will not allow it. And Dave and I both really wanted, Larry, when Larry indicated he wanted to be in the book, we were both really happy to get him there. And then when it came time to write the story, Larry said, hey, I think I'm going to do this a story in the Hammers universe, but from the other side. And I immediately called Dave and like, is this okay? You know, this is uh, uh, an awkward situation because I know you've specifically not done that. And I probably could have talked to Larry something else. He's a pro and he would have done it, but it's really what he wanted to do. And Dave was like, this one time, this one book, yes. So uh, for anybody interested in writing uh, future Hammer stories, no, this is the special Larry Korea special Onward Drake exception. But uh, this will probably... Uh, be the only time anybody else ever gets to write in that universe. Well, it's a it's a fun story, and uh, as you said, it's from the perspective of the other side of uh, someone fighting against the Hammer Slammers and how that goes. So it's an interesting look at the that world, and uh, neat to know that it will be it is it's, it's a one off. It's the only time it's going to happen. So that's kind of neat. Um, let's shift and talk to Mark. You've got a story in the anthology called All That's Left. And uh, I just wanted you, and when we talk to everyone else, I want them to do, say the same. Just uh, tell a little bit about it and then um, how it relates uh, in your mind to David Drake, if you would. Because there's very few, uh, Larry Korea's story is this way, but there, a lot of the stories in here, and I think just about all of you all on today, they're not um, necessarily set in David Drake's worlds or using his characters. They're... Um, they're more inspired by, and uh, that's the case with this one. So how was this inspired by uh, Dave Drake? Well, first let me note about all the stories. I very much did not ask people uh, to write in Dave's universes and did not want that. Uh, I know Dave would not want that. Instead, what I asked people was to do a story that for them was tied to, inspired by, related to, David Drake. And I think that because of that, we got great work from all the writers and we got stories that ran the, the gamut from uh, sort of, uh, as Dave calls it, high lit fic to uh, fantasy to, you know, the dark, 
uh, horror kind of stories. In my case, Dave and I share uh, an unfortunate trait, which is a bad PTSD. And in my case, it uh, comes from a, a prolonged multi-year period of uh, being an abused kid and also spending three years in a paramilitary group from when I was 10 to 13. In Dave's case, it comes from being in Vietnam. A lot of people nowadays talk about PTSD as if they know about it. And there are a lot of good articles out there, and it's great to see attention being paid to PTSD. But what almost nobody talks about is an aspect of being in those situations that is um, the self, basically self-loathing that comes from doing things that in the moment are the things you have to do, but that are bad things. And that is just rarely discussed in fiction. It's, for obvious reasons, rarely discussed by the people involved. Dave and I have talked about that. Um, we've both done bad things in situations that uh, we'd probably do it again. And so I wanted to write directly to the heart of that uh, because it's something that Dave and I share and that I think a, a lot of veterans and people with rough jobs and uh, survivors of abuse frequently share. So I tried to write directly to uh, the whole topic of self-loathing and what it's like. And I did a near-future SF story because there are actually uh, defense department investigations right now into wiping memories as a way to fix PTSD. And the other thing I did in the story that was kind of fun, at the time I wrote the story, there was a, a lot of uh, controversy going on around awards and stuff, a topic I don't really want to go into. But a lot of people, I feel, quite unfairly characterize Bain as a single thing, almost like it's a single being, but it's not. Bain publishes a huge variety of people with a huge variety of political beliefs and social beliefs and so on. So when I wrote this story, I set out to... Uh, write a story that most people, if they read it elsewhere, would never believe that Bain had originally published it. So um, it was those factors that came together. Because Dave is not uh, a simple person politically or socially or any other way, and people who try to pigeonhole him without thought are making a mistake. So I wanted to have some of that complexity in the fiction as well. Yeah, I think it comes across, and I think it uh, it's a very uh, powerful story. And uh, it is like it's military science fiction, but it is uh, maybe not what immediately comes to mind when you uh, when you hear that term. So um, I think it worked. Um, let's uh, let me talk to Eric Flint for just a moment. Um, as I mentioned, you uh, collaborated with uh, David Drake on the Belisaria series and, and one book in the General series, um, which is sort of related uh, to the Belisaria series or vice versa. Um, and you called that um, time working on those first books in the, the Belisari series, you, you said it was sort of like an apprenticeship under David Drake, and that you learned uh, quite a bit from him. And in a way, your story, which is called A Flat Affect, um, sort of works as a metaphor or a, I don't want to say allegory, it's not quite that one-to-one, -one, but um, for that experience. And uh, again, it's, I guess, same question to you. Um, you know, how did how what did you learn from David Drake, and uh, how does the story tie in to that? The main thing I learned a lot of things from David, but the main thing that I think I learned from, which I tried to, I did talk about actually in my uh, afterward I wrote for the story, is basically how to structure a novel in the first place. Um, it's how how you make a plot work, um, and. I discovered that I spent two solid years working with David on those books. I spent more time than that in the books, but that two years I didn't work on anything else except the Belisarius books, and that's the only time I've ever done that for that long a period of time in my life. Um, and two things happened while I was doing that. One of them is I expanded... Dave, if you go back and read Dave's original plot outline, which we have published somewhere online, it's much, um, it's much more sparse than with the books that finally came out of it. Um, 
But I didn't change any of the actual logic of the story. I just expanded outward a whole lot of things that he had just left kind of very spare. Um, so the end result wound up being six books instead of three he'd originally projected. But if you look at the overall story arc and the whole architecture of the story, nothing really fundamental changed at all. And whenever I did find myself trying to change something, it didn't work right. Um, because that's what a good, well-plotted story is like. Anyway, when uh, Mark asked me to write a story for it, um, I just thought it would be amusing to recast the history of how that series got worked and my relationship with David and also Jim Bain and just do it as a kind of lighthearted, not quite comic fantasy. It's not really a comedy, but, but a kind of lighthearted. Uh, I wanted to get a certain kind of Jack Mance flavor to the story, which I think I succeeded in doing. Um, that just would sort of retell it as a kind of fantasy tale. Um, and I wanted two things out of it. One, I want to write a story that would, that would, that David himself would enjoy, which I know he did, because he told me he had. And also that would be accessible to anybody who read it who didn't know, because most people who read that story are not going to realize that it's basically an allegory, um, because they don't know the history. Although I sort of indicate it in the afterward, but they should still be able to enjoy it in its own terms. <coughs> um, and that just seemed like the most fun to write, so I did it. Uh, and it was. It took me, I think, two days to write the story. I think it was fun to read. I think it holds up on its own if you don't know the backstory. Um, and I think you said your experience was um, it was supposed to be three books and then it became six. And uh, Tony Daniel, you've got a, a similar experience with uh, you wrote the last two co-wrote the last two novels in the general series. Uh, and it was supposed to be the last one novel in the general series. Right. And so maybe double what Dave's outlines seem to fit. Right. Uh, did you want to talk about, we've talked about that on the podcast in the past, but uh, for those who haven't been listening quite that long or who haven't delved into the archives, um, do you want to talk about that? Your experiences uh, working with those, on those books with uh, Dave Drake? Um, sure. Well, I, um, Dave uh, had written this outline um, that was, it's probably about ten, fifteen thousand words. It's not a short little outline um, for the book, The Heretic, which um, I guess Eric had had originally um, been one of, been slated for, but then uh, it couldn't get done, and, and it just sat around the main office for a long time. And um, Tony, just one day, Tony, my boss, Tony Weisskopf, um, just asked if if I wanted to take it on. Um, she saw some affinity of, of my own and Dave's work, I guess. I don't know. But um, <clears throat> I started working on it. I had never met Dave at that time, um, but I read his stuff, and I really liked it. I, li- I liked his um, prose style very much and his um, relentless attention to stay- sticking to the story. And um, so, But I found that what for Dave is one book in an outline <laughs> was for me like two books. Uh, and, and there was just no way I could get uh, a regular size novel um, done with that outline. It had so much in it that needed, that I wanted to develop, that, that spoke to me to develop. I also found, like Eric, that when I got away from the outline or let myself drift, um, it didn't work. And so pulling myself back to the outline, um, sort of like just imbibing the outline was um, was the way that um, the books got written. And, and I think it was really... Um, really useful. Um, I'd written, you know, several books before, but, but, uh, I think it really, you know, drove home some points about story and structure and, and detail that, that I hadn't really thought about hard before. So those books are the heretic and, and the savior, but, um, my story in the collection is very different from, from any of that because, um, after I had met Dave and talked to him, I found out he was um, Manly Wade Wellman's uh, literary ex- executor, and um, I, I was—I've always been a big fan of Wellman, and um, especially his Silver John uh, uh, Appalachian uh, fantasy stories. And I had never known that that Dave had written Old Nathan, which is kind of an homage um, to his friend. Manly Wade Wellman, and 
um, I went and read old Nathan uh, after I I think written after I met Dave after I'd written the Heretic, um, and uh, I just loved it. It was it's become my favorite Drake, um, Drake work of all time. It's, it's kind of a novella collection, but it's also a novel, um, and it's it, it's a fantasy about a guy who's very grumpy and talks to animals in the uh, <laughs> in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and, it, and it's and it's, the animals talk back to him too. They do. They're gre- They're they're grim animals. There's a bull that, you know, they're Dave Drake animals. Yeah. And I I just loved it. And um, so when it came time to when Mark asked me to write this, I was like, well, what do I want to do? Um, and I thought that what I'd really like to do is an homage to David Drake's homage. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's kind of meta, but. Uh, and and I and I also just had an idea, you know, that that fit that, um, and so it, I wrote my story uh, as an homage to David's homage. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, let me talk to let's talk to Hank Davis right quick. Um, Hank, you and uh, in your little uh, I should mention everybody uh, has written a little afterward to their story in here, kind of. Um, Talking about some of the things we're talking about, uh, memories of David Drake and how they encountered him, and um, favorite stories, etc. And in uh, Hank, in your afterward, you talk about um, you and uh, Drake have a, a lot in common, uh, taste-wise. The pulps of uh, yesteryear old movie serials. You're both Vietnam veterans, and of course, you mentioned the singer Peggy Lee. You're both big fans. Um, I always, when I've been uh, talking with Tony Weisskopf or Tony Daniel about something, some writer or story from the 40s or 50s, it's always, uh, let me check with either Hank or David Drake. Like, that's what everyone, you you two guys are the go-to guys on that stuff, seems like. Um, and you draw on some of that um, shared interest and shared backgrounds in your story. Uh, if you could just uh, talk a little bit about it. It's called The Trouble with Telepaths. Uh, yeah, and uh, I actually didn't realize this when I wrote it until Dave mentioned it. He said, you know, you've written the perfect 1950s telepath story. And I realized uh, that was right. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, there were lots of stories about telepaths. Uh, one of the most famous is The Demolished Man, which assumed that telepathy would be developed, uh, we would get control of it, it would become a commonplace and, of course, none of that's happened, and people don't generally write them as much anymore, uh, in, in part, I think, because John Campbell was fascinated by it, and he's been gone since 71, I believe. But I was, I was kind of unconscious. Uh, Dave, Dave also said he liked the fact that he and I might be the only readers who really understood uh, how how well I'd gotten what it's like to be in the Army. <clears throat> Although I'm sure there are lots of veterans who will read it and catch up on that. And also, <clears throat> anyway, since Dave uh, is is a fan of H.P. Lovecraft, as am I, and, and uh, Dave was once being interviewed for a newspaper. This is somewhere in one of his introductions in one of his books. Was being interviewed by a reporter who had never heard of Charles Fort. And they made the mistake of saying that he was a Fortean, which is someone who follows Charles Fort, or at least is interested in Charles Fort. And, the, and it appeared the paper as having said he was a Freudian. Which <laughs> Not the same. He had, to, had to take a lot of kidding from his friends for a while. <laughs> but since we're, we're, we're both uh, have been influenced by Charles Fort, who recorded all sorts of impossible things happening for, for long books worth, uh, beginning with the Book of the Damned, and, and which uh, the, uh, the books of Charles Fort incidentally are available as ebooks on made.com. So I, I thought I would throw that in, the Army, Charles Fort, and H.P. Lovecraft, and I came up with this thing. And uh, towards the end, I was uh, torn between two similar but slightly different endings, and I finally took the coward's way out and threw them at Mark and said, which one do you like better? And, and Mark actually did a blend of them. 
anyway, this is this is a story about a future army, uh, not terribly far in the future, although they have something like anti-gravity is the main difference. And they're not using helicopters anymore. They're using little egg-shaped uh, anti-gravity-powered devices. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same army that I knew back in the 60s and the, and the first year of the 70s. Uh, and apparently, I had the target to save like that part of it. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll leave it to people to, to discover what exactly happens in the story. But yeah, there's a great. You said unfortunately you weren't able to work Peggy Lee in, though. I don't think, right? Yeah, I, I discovered Dave was a Peggy Lee fan one day when I called him up, and he said, "Oh, oh." Uh, sorry, I, I I had to stop playing this Peggy Lee record, or maybe it was a CD. I, I should make that Peggy Lee isn't my favorite singer. That's Carmen McRae, but uh, she's up there. Well, thanks. Let's get to, we'll set the record straight on that. Um, well, so that kind of covers uh, the the book and um, everyone's stories in there. I just wondered, many of you have known uh, David Drake for many many years. Um, and uh, I just wondered if anyone had a, if you want, if you had an anecdote, uh, something that you wanted to, sh- you know, share, something that you think would, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, illuminate the kind of guy that uh, that Drake is. Anybody got something? So I've told this story before, but it's a funny one. Uh, Dave and I became friends about uh, 30 years ago when... I had been going to the annual pig picking that he throws at his house around his birthday each year, but I didn't really know them. I was just part of the SF fandom that was showing up. And so I wanted to do something uh, more personal, so I offered uh, my wife and I would take uh, Dave and his wife Joe out for dinner. And they said, sure. And uh, Joe was in a mood to dress up, so at that time I had a membership to the Capital City Club in downtown Raleigh. I don't even know if it's still there, but it was a private restaurant. And, uh, dining options were a lot more limited in Raleigh then. So we go to this fancy restaurant. We're in suits, and the women are in fancy dresses. And uh, Dave, for those who don't know, is famously unable to find his way anywhere. <laughs> he can get lost walking back from a bathroom at a restaurant, literally. So we are... Uh, at this restaurant, I get up to go to the restroom, and Dave a moment later follows. So he's just a little bit behind me, but left so he could see me and find where it was. Uh, I'm standing at one urinal. There's a second urinal. He comes up, stands at it, and then he says in a very loud voice, Hi, sweetie. Um, <laughs> at which point I apparently go from focused to very focused, and what neither of us knows is that there's another guest, uh, a member of the club, who's in a stall. This is a very, very uptight Raleigh businessman who comes bursting out of the stall without looking at either of us and runs out of the restroom. I mean, <laughs> and so Dave and I start laughing hilariously, and we've been uh, great friends since then. And in a sort of the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree moment, uh, many, many years later, uh, Dave and I. And our extended family are at the 30th birthday party of his son, Jonathan. At the end of the dinner, we're at the Angus Bar and having dinner. At the end of it, uh, Dave and I are both in the bathroom. Jonathan pushes open the door, sees the two of us in the bathroom, and in a booming voice goes, Oh, good, a threesome. The humor has <laughs> continued on, and the story is kind of uh, legendary in our families. But with Dave, stories are uh, readily at hand because he is somebody who says what he thinks and uh, does not generally hold back much. Hey, Mark, uh, would you care to mention anything about your daughter's story, uh, which I thought oh, was sure. really um, great? Yeah, I. it's an interesting thing. When I was doing the book, I wanted people who were influenced by Dave. I wanted a variety Uh and I realized that my daughter, Sarah, who is, I think, a really, really talented writer. Obviously, as a parent, you are uh, prone to be biased, but I I could give you a lot of reasons why I believe that, awards and other things. But uh, she had sold a few stories in the mainstream press. She was working uh, multiple drafts into a YA novel, and she had something that I could not get anywhere else. 
which is that she grew up in a world that had Dave in it. Dave was at her first birthday party. She has vacation with Dave every year of her life. Um, and as her afterward begins, uh, I have never known a world without Dave. And so I thought, there is no other writer I know who um, could give that perspective. And so I asked her to uh, write a story. Um, and I was tickled because what she did uh, with uh, her piece was take something that very much happened, which is Dave and Joe have gone with our family to the state fair for basically Sarah's entire life. And there was a time when Dave volunteered to go on a carousel with her when she was, I forget, five to eight, somewhere in that range. And they did, in fact, as in the story, sit in a little spinning pot, and Sarah got into it. And at the end of the carousel ride, what really happened was Dave got off and threw up, uh, <laughs> totally underestimating the power of a kid to spin him around. Um, but Sarah keyed off this event into this whole time travel alien thing. And I thought that she nailed Dave's mannerisms and perspective of Dave from a child. And so I was tickle pink because nobody else I know who's a writer has grown up with Dave. Yeah, it was it was a, a good little story. I'm glad, Tony, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, well, we're uh, we are kind of getting toward the end here, and I just wanted to go and ask everybody. Um, if you can an answer either or both of these questions, which is um, maybe a favorite David Drake story or novel or series or, and, and or someone who is maybe hearing about David Drake for the first time, hard as that is to believe, uh, where you think they might want to start. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Mark, why don't you take that and we'll, we'll go around the circle metaphorically. All right. I will give three short answers. Um, for the single most powerful short piece of fiction from Dave, I would nominate The Darkness, which is available from Bain in the Complete Hammer Slammers, I think, the third volume. It's a, a low action set mostly in a hospital bed, although there are flashbacks to action, um, direct take on the alienation of a veteran. For the book that has done the most good for people, um, in that I've, I've, Dave has shared with me just I don't know how many email messages over the year from people who found this book and clung to it. Redliners, which is available from Bain. And then for people who uh, want the just more straightforward uh, science fiction, um, space opera, grand adventure, any of the uh, RCN books, you know, uh, the Leary Mundy books that I think, I don't even know, eight books out, something like that. Uh, and another one coming. I think any of those would be a great introduction for somebody who just wants fun fiction. But I would I would cite those three. Yeah, I think Redliners, um, as I understand it, uh, David Drake has said that's his. I don't know favorite, but um, you know that one means a lot to him as well. So uh, I think that's probably a good suggestion there. Um, Eric Flint, what do you think? Favorite book or where people should start? I think the most striking. Book, okay, that David's probably ever written is Old Nathan. Um, it's um, that's an absolutely brilliant book. Um, it is, uh, and it. In fact, I actually <laughs> talked Jim Bain into letting me do an anthology just so I could get David's book back in print. So I wound up writing a short novel for Ike Spore Fort, and we also reissued um, a lot of the stories, a set of stories by Henry Cutner. Um, it's just a brilliant novel, and it's not anywhere near as well known as a lot of his other writings. Um, doesn't have anything like the the, the fame of of uh, the Hammer Slammer books, but it's. Uh, you know, I, I just it's really a brilliant book, and I would urge anyone who hasn't read it to read it, um, because you probably haven't read it if you're listening to this. Um, and I will just leave it at that. Yeah, I think I could be wrong about this, but that one may be in the Bain Free Library. Hank or Tony, do you know? Uh, 
I, I don't know if it's free, but I'm I pretty think sure we, it is. I think it is available on the bay. Now that you mention it, I think it is. I'm not positive, but I think it is, yeah, actually. The the title is an old data, and I can't remember what the title is of the book that has the cut there at uh, well, uh, Mountain Magic, Magic, I think. It's, Mountain Magic. Area, it's, called it's, Mountain, right. it's called Mountain Magic, and it has what is easily the worst cover I've ever got from Bay Books on it. And to this day, I do not know what possessed Jim Bain to do that cover, especially because <laughs> Reich and I, and I had Reich, he wrote the first draft, but I gave him the scene to put in there. There is a scene where, and you could put this on a cover, and it would be absolutely legitimate because the scene appears in the book where this very good-looking young woman has to strip down to her underwear in order to race through a gauntlet because she's got to get rid of any possible metal facing this weird monster. So it would have been a no-exploding spaceship, but short of that, it would have been a really classic Garish main cover, and instead... Jim did this pastiche with this god awful horrible Boris Karloff thingy. I don't know why. I, 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 I yeah. you know, I, I was so like appalled that I never had the nerve of. to ask him why he'd gone mad. But um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. We will, we will not mention the name of the artist. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even sure there was an artist. Oh, I, yeah, I, I don't even artist. know that. I, I, it wasn't even like it was art. It was just kind of a, pa a weird sort of. Pa I don't know. Anyway, never mind. You'd have to go look at it. But uh, I, I, I was, I've been traumatized ever since. Let's put it that way. All right. Well, Tony, uh, I think Eric Flint may have taken your answer. I know you're you are obviously an old Nathan fan. Hank, uh, what about you? You have any a uh, favorite um, or some some thing, something else you would suggest? Not very, not very original. I, I, I think I go with Red Lighters as my favorite Drake novel. And the the short story of his I've read I like best. I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember the title. It's in uh, Night and Demons. It's the one about uh, a, a soldier coming back from Vietnam who's dying from cancer. And and my my admira admiration for it is that the whole mechanism works. So well, it's it's like a fine Swiss watch. If the Swiss still make wa watches, uh, and it's just, it's just such a polished work. And uh, I, I'm seeing it as a writer and an editor, of course. The one who's just a reader might uh, not be affected that way. But that that is my favorite Drake story. Maybe I should phone you later and tell you what the title was. Yeah, well, it's in Night and Demons, which is uh, a collection of. Mostly horror, right? Or horror stories that uh, right, horror story. Drake has written. Yeah. Yeah, that's how they uh, work in. Yeah, and he's a really good horror. I'm a big, I'm a, as Tony and Hank, as you know, I'm a big horror fan. And, uh, I, you know, didn't really know, I wasn't as familiar with that side of his stuff. So I've, uh, you know, everything I've read, I've been impressed with of his, uh, on, on that front as well. I love the way he always, uh, he always calls August Durlis, Mr. Durlis. Durlith bought his first short story, if I'm if I'm remembering right. Is that correct? Yeah, his his first yeah. story was uh, he refers to it as a, as a pastiche of Durlith's pastiche Lovecraft, <laughs> and, uh -huh. and it's a better story than he gives it credit for, I think. Uh, although it does have a, a really old fashioned setup. I mean, it's, it's possible in an alternate universe where Dave wasn't drafted that. He's known as a horror writer instead of a science fiction writer. Maybe you should we sh you should write that story for like Onward Drake Two. That is a genuinely frightening thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right up, right up I, there. See, I'm gonna have like trouble pitches. sleeping at night thinking about that. But all right. <laughs> yeah, instead of instead of Stephen King being the uh, deed of horror fiction, David Drake, the deed of horror fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I better stop right there. Well, all right, everyone. I think we've uh, about covered it. So I want to say thank you to Eric Flint, Tony Daniel, Hank Davis, and Mark Van Name. Uh, the book is Onward Drake. It is available in uh, hardcover and a limited leather uh, bound edition. Uh, or if you are going to World Fantasy, the World Fantasy Convention, it will be a giveaway there. 
Uh, thanks so much. All right. Thanks, thank you, David. David. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Just had a quick coda to the interview we just did. Hank Davis got in touch with me after we had finished recording to let me know the name of the story he was talking about is Something Had to Be Done. And as we said, it can be found in the uh, David Drake horror collection, Night and Demons. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Book Two I Will Not Bow Watch the end through dying eyes. Now the dark is taking over. Show me where forever dies. Take the fall and run to heaven. All is lost again but I'm not giving in. I will not bow. I will not break. I will shut the world away. I will not fall. I will not fade. I will take your breath away. I will not bow. Breaking Benjamin. Dear Agony. Prologue. It is requested that passengers move to their designated lifeboats, the annunciator purred over the screams. Gwyn, come on, Chris Phillips yelled from the lifeboat. Chris had spent ten years in the Royal Navy as a chef. That was not a cook, as he liked to point out. He was a Royal Navy chef. There was a difference, and Stephen Seagal didn't know the difference. But after a while, the allure of Navy life palled. He still enjoyed the sea, the problem was he never got to see it except from land. He was a very good chef. Good chefs served admirals, and admirals generally were also landbound. So he'd quit and put out some resumes, which was how he ended up as a chef for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines and met the love of his life, third officer, staff, Gwyneth Stevens. After years of bachelorhood that had most people joking about his actual tastes, He'd proposed only two months ago. Then the H7 virus had broken out. They'd pieced together that the bastard who spread it had left one of his calling cards at the cruise terminal in New York, which meant that there were at least 15 patient zeros on the boat, and by the time they found that out, there were more. The boat had been put in at-sea quarantine. Then the afflicted had started to turn, and without antigen testers, they couldn't screen for who was infected and who wasn't, and then it spiraled. The captain and the other ship officers were already gone, taking all the powered lifeboats, but staff side had stayed on. The ship officers, Greeks, as was common, considered themselves only responsible for the ship. When it was clear the infected had control and there was nothing to do about it, they had given an almost gallic shrug and fled. The bastards. Staff side was responsible for the passengers, and they were chosen from people like Gwyn, who took that job seriously. The senior officer's staff had already turned when the first officer gave the order to abandon ship. Thomas, though, was still standing his post. He intended to go to full lockdown as soon as the boats were away. Since passengers had been issued water and food in their quarters, assuming that help arrived soon, a major assumption... Perhaps a few would survive. Gwyn kept looking for one more passenger who could make it. There might be more, she said. The infected came from out of nowhere and hit her like a rugby player, taking her down and biting at the back of her neck. Gwyn, Chris yelled, scrambling up the short steps. He grabbed the infected and punched him in the back of the neck, hard. It knocked the thing out for a moment. Gwyn. Come on, honey, Chris said, pulling her up. Please. 
Go, Gwen said, holding the back of her neck to staunch the blood flow. Just go. I can't, honey, Chris said. Please, darling. Go, Gwen screamed. I'm infected. I can't board. Go. She stood up and pushed him to the boarding steps. Normally, this light woman wouldn't have moved his nearly two meter, 15 stone mass, but he backed up. It's duty, darling, Gwen said, sobbing. Just duty. One last kiss, Chris said. One. He gave her a hug and kissed her, then allowed her to push him into the raft. Love, Gwen said, tears streaming down her face. And survive. Gwen closed the hatch, and Chris took his seat under the big red lever that said, do not pull. Ladies and gentlemen, please assume what are called in the airline industry crash positions. Bent over at the waist, arms wrapped around your legs, he said tonelessly to the mostly shocked or crying passengers. There will be a brief sensation of falling, then a light impact. I'm told it's a bit like a carnival ride. He reached up to the bar and pulled down hard. Last ride of the day. Chapter 15 Blood-splattered blue curtains rippled to the rocking of the boat as Steve stepped over the corpse of the former owner. From the loose skin, the man had probably been heavy set before turning zombie. By the time they boarded the boat, he was clearly on the edge of starvation. Who chooses blue curtains with a maroon interior? Faith asked, her voice muffled by her respirator. At a guess, Steve said, gesturing at a gnawed corpse in the corner. Huh. The body had been chewed down to the bones. There was still a mass of goo from decomposition staining the maroon carpets. They'd lured the zombie to the rear sliding doors. Then when Faith jerked them open, Steve had terminated the hostile infected. At least that was how he was going to write it up in the ship's log. This one usable? Faith asked. Too early to tell, Steve said. But we're definitely going to have to fumigate. The hunter was about done. Three weeks after leaving New York Harbor, they'd hit a heavy tropical storm that had ripped away the wind generator as well as half the deck rigs and railings. Steve had seriously reconsidered his choice of zombie plans as the craft pitched uncontrollably through 50-foot swells. But, based upon what they were getting, or had stopped getting from land, a tropical storm was better than a zombie storm. One by one, shortwave radio stations had stopped broadcasting, first the major commercial news stations, then governments. The last official station to broadcast was the beep from a location in Scotland. And then one day, it was silent. That left only amateur ham radio operators who reported large crowds of zombies roaming even through rural districts. One station, Zombie Team Alpha from Kansas, had boasted it was prepared for any zombie attack. Then an attack, then silence. There are still a few broadcasting out there, mostly from deep in the Arctic, but they were doing it quiet. What puzzled Steve was that GPS was still up. As he understood it, GPS depended upon an atomic clock somewhere in Colorado. Since it was unlikely that that facility had held out, he wasn't sure why it was still working, but he was glad it was. Sophia and Stacy had waded through a book on celestial navigation and learned how to do it but he wasn't looking forward to the day they had to use that method. Whatever the case, they needed a new ride, and the Fairline 65 twin diesel, christened Tina's toy, looked to be a pretty good choice. The boat was the first they'd tried to board. They had had a few of what might have been attacks in the couple weeks after leaving New York. The waters then in the area were fairly crowded, and the sailboat, filled with mostly women, must have looked like an inviting target. But whenever a boat tracked towards them, they just started breaking out the equipment. And as more and more body-armored and heavily armed people came on deck, boats would just sort of turn away. 
To avoid the crowded NYC Bermuda Norfolk corridor, Steve had turned northeast into the deep Atlantic. The family had basically sailed in the direction of Iceland, then back down into the U.S. region. By the time they came back, there were far fewer boats, at least boats under power and control. They had seen several boats and even freighters under power, but clearly not in control. One encounter at night had nearly resulted in what would surely have been a fatal collision. Only quick action on Sophia's part had gotten the tiny sailboat out of the way of the massive freighter. Just adjusting to being shipboard had been hard. None of them had any serious at-sea experience. It was the one flaw in Steve's zombie plan, and a couple of times it had nearly cost them. Forget that the girls had to learn to find their own space on the relatively tiny craft. And learn that there were tasks that had to be completed, and that they had to find their own entertainment. Some of the tasks, like fire drills, had proven out when they had their first galley fire. Then there had been the possible attacks, the tropical storm, and just learning to adjust to being on a boat, which was a big enough problem. In the last two weeks, they hadn't had any similar problems. They hadn't seen many small boats, but floating freighters and tankers seemed to be everywhere. However, in the two months they'd been cautiously avoiding contact, they'd also used up the bulk of their stores. They were flat out of fuel for cooking, nearly out of fuel for the generator, and when that ran out, they wouldn't be able to produce drinkable water. Definitely time to find another home. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to David F. Sharirod and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a near-miss comet sending down a meteoric rain of gold in small non-lethal droplets and the pig-picking thanks and gratitude of a grateful Mason and his secret society of David Drake reading tailgaters. And from the rest of us here at the Bain Free Radio Hour, to Mark L. Van Name, Eric Flint, and Hank Davis, editor and authors in Onward Drake. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. Keep reaching for the stars. The Bain Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. Thank you.